Amen. Aren't we blessed to worship an amazing God? And I am blessed to be here worshiping God alongside you today. I am grateful to Pastor Chris for the opportunity to be with you today as he spends some time bonding with his newly expanded family. And I celebrate along with you the addition of Carter to their sweet family. Our scripture passage this morning we have already heard a good bit of, thanks to Nikki and the children, and I am grateful for the way that they have already absorbed that scripture. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and read it. This is um, the early part of Acts as the church is starting to expand out from Jerusalem, and Philip has been in Samaria spreading the good news there. Let us listen for a word from the Lord together. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And this is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you're reading? He replied, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? about himself or someone else. Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, there's some water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop. And both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the gift of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer, please? Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A couple of months ago, I was driving home from two really fun days of leading workshops in Mississippi. The sun was setting and the sky was showing off its neon pinks and oranges. I was bebopping along the interstate making really good time. I was listening to a podcast that was funny yet thought-provoking. I was looking forward to kissing my son goodnight when I got to my house. Everything was copacetic. And then, an unidentifiable feathered mass hurtled through the air and shattered my windshield on the passenger side. I was not hurt, but my windshield was bowed inward and spraying shrapnel into the car. I pulled over at the next safe place, a rest area, and waited on the tow truck. 
Every day when we get in our cars, we are exercising a lot of trust. Trust that objects won't come from out of nowhere and disable our vehicles. Trust that oncoming traffic will stay on its side of the double yellow line. Trust that stoplights at intersections have been well-timed so that I don't have a green at the same time as cars that would be turning into my path. Trust in the authorities that they will penalize those who drive recklessly. This trust is order, predictability, and we see it in other areas of our daily lives as well. We trust that people will follow formal rules and unstated norms. We trust that those in our lives will act in ways that we've come to expect from them. We trust that the safety nets we've built or that have been built for us will be there for us when we need them, like medical insurance, social security, school programs that address learning disabilities, and regular inspections of food and bridges and workplace conditions. Leaning on this predictability is a kind of trust. There is also a deeper, harder level of trust that depends on our willingness to engage with the unpredictable. It depends on our readiness to ask hard questions, not knowing what the answers will be. It depends on our receptivity to those who don't look, talk, think, or live like us. It depends on our openness to changing our minds about important issues in light of new facts or personal experiences. It depends on our ability to, to speak aloud our feelings and to make space safe for others to do the same. It depends on our eagerness to try things that will stretch us even if we turn out to be no good at them. And in all of this, the second level of trust depends on our willingness to believe that we are giving ourselves over more fully to abundant life, not to pointless, persistent heartache. It's this deeper trust that runs throughout our scripture for today. We pick up with Philip, one of the seven men chosen by the apostles to make sure the widows in their community don't go hungry. In other words, Philip has essentially been hired as a server at Cracker Barrel. And yet, the running of biscuits and grits is not all that God has called Philip to do. When the persecutions of Jewish Christians begin, Philip takes up Jesus' charge to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth and takes the good news to Samaria. You might remember from Luke's story of the Good Samaritan that the Jews typically wanted as little to do with the Samaritans as possible. Yet we have no record of Philip saying, wait, what? When, the, when God nudges him north. It's in Samaria, after the joyful conversion of the eager residents, that an angel whispers in Philip's ear, go to a deserted road for a reason I won't yet tell you. Again, Philip gets up and goes with nary a clarifying question. It's on this wilderness road that Philip encounters an Ethiopian eunuch. This man is important. He oversees all of his country's finances. This eunuch is himself wealthy as he has a sweet ride that he can take on long trips. He's well educated, reading passages from Isaiah as he travels. Though we don't know his religious background, he's at least curious enough about Judaism to possess the scroll of scripture and visit the Jerusalem temple. Despite his impressive bio, however, the Jewish purity code is clear that eunuchs are unclean. As such, this man could not have entered the temple itself and the worshipers there would likely not have interacted with him because they would not have want to have become tainted by association. He would have been on the outside looking in, 
literally and figuratively. But that confounding spirit elbows Philip and tells him to approach the eunuch's chariot and to get in. And again, Philip responds with an okie dokie, running alongside the eunuch and asking, you getting all that? Pointing to the scroll of scripture. Nope, nobody will even look at me, much less explain it to me. And instead of getting defensive about Philip's question, the eunuch scooches over to make room in his royal chariot for this guy who came out of nowhere on this deserted road and startled him in his solitude. The eunuch trusts this stranger and his motives just as Philip trusts the spirit, which has landed him in yet another unlikely place, talking to, touching, and welcoming this so-called unclean person into the faith. We don't know how long the conversation lasts or what all of the eunuch's questions are. We do know that he is convicted by what he hears, though, because when the chariot fortuitously comes upon a body of water, he gets excited and asks, what's to stop me from being baptized? Now, technically, there's a lot in the way. As preaching professor Tom Long points out, the eunuch is from the wrong nation. He's no Israelite. He's got the wrong job. He's loyal to a foreign queen. And as a eunuch, he is wrong anatomically, or so says Leviticus. But Philip, trusting that the Spirit has brought him to this man on this deserted road for such a purpose, wades down into the water with the eunuch, helping him identify with Christ's death and resurrection through his immersion. The story of Philip and the eunuch is one of trust, but this trust is not built on predictability. Otherwise, it would have been a, a much shorter passage. It could have ended with Philip asking the angel for a map with a big X to mark his precise destination. It could have ended with Philip pressing the spirit for more details. It could have ended with Philip continuing to run alongside the chariot, citing purity concerns, with the conversation shouted back and forth instead of any real connection being forged. It could have ended with Philip saying, hold up there, cowboy, I'm happy to tell you about Jesus, but baptism is a bridge too far. Those are the outcomes that would have been built on formal rules and unstated norms. But the spirit, Philip, and the eunuch don't traffic in that surface level of trust. Instead, they trust at the level of vulnerability, of, I think something new is happening here, even though I don't understand what God is up to yet. They get an important distinction, that knowing scripture, with its rules and checkboxes, its double yellow lines and its traffic lights is not the same as knowing the God of Scripture who is capable of joyful surprises in the name of love. This God of Scripture gives us the incarnation of our Savior as a defenseless baby. The frankly controversial life of Jesus, Jesus is Crucifixion is criminal rather than king. Christ's bodily resurrection with scars and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. None of these was what the Jews expected, even with their prophecies about the coming Messiah. All of these are game changers. And Philip's ability to trust the Spirit and the eunuch's willingness to trust him lead them both into the waters of baptism where the eunuch professes his trust in Jesus. I want to grow my trust in the spirit and in others 
so that I can help people trust Jesus. Don't you? To do that, we must first know and trust that unpredictable God of Scripture. That requires spending time with God, wherever and whenever and by whatever means we feel most connected with our source of all life and love. It necessitates listening to God, not just talking at God. It calls for bringing the fullness of ourselves before God with our celebrations and our hurts, our praises and our doubts. It involves looking for where God is at work all around us, sometimes in showy ways and sometimes by barely perceptible means. If we can do these things, then with God's help, we'll be able to open ourselves to an honest conversation with someone of a different political persuasion about the hopes and fears that undergird our positions. Then we'll be willing to go to places where the people don't look like us to listen and learn and build relationships. Then we'll be happy to give away more of our time, our energy, our money, in the belief that we'll still have all that we need. Then we'll be eager to try something we're not sure we can do, whether as individuals or as a church. As we respond to these spirit-offered opportunities, others will notice. They will invite us into their chariots to tell them more. And they will encounter the God of Scripture such that they will ask, what is to prevent me from becoming a disciple? I want to tell you a secret. As a middle schooler, I despised going to church. I used every excuse I could come up with to get out of it. I had so much homework I had to finish before Monday. I felt feverish. I was too tired. These attempts rarely worked on my parents. So I would go to my Sunday school class where my teachers, Greg and Linda, would tell me everything that was wrong about the world and about my really pretty boring choices. The music I listened to was of the devil. Not really. I needed to watch out for bad people. I had to pray out loud in front of the class no matter how much it made me sweat. And I couldn't ask questions, even though I had some really big ones. Honestly, a lot of what they said followed the letter of scripture. They were, after all, faithful people. But none of what they told me made me want to have a relationship with Jesus. Their teachings were all too neat, too predictable, too closed. To their credit, my parents took my faith struggles seriously, and we began looking for a new church. It took a while, but we landed somewhere with really receptive youth leaders. My questions made them very nervous. They never knew what I was going to ask next. But by their demeanor, they asked, do you understand what you're reading? And I responded, how can I unless someone explains it to me? The spirit kept prodding my teachers to remain open to whatever challenge I brought. And I let them into my mind and my heart as I tried to grasp who Jesus is and what he's all about. We sat together, Sunday after Sunday, talking about the meaning and the application of scripture until I realized they had not just unlocked scripture for me. They had introduced me to the God of scripture. Because they dared trust the spirit, and I had dared to trust them, I was ready to trust Jesus. With joy and confidence, I descended into the waters of baptism with my youth minister, Quinn. This deeper level of trust, the kind built on unpredictability, is hard. 
It's risky. It's scary. It's also faithful. We cannot run from it if we are going to grow as Jesus' disciples. Because as Christians, as little Christ, as Jesus' body here on earth, we are called to be like him. To be vulnerable like that baby born in a barn. To be real friends with the kinds of people who are too often shunned. To do things we don't want to do for the sake of others. To show our scars, knowing that they are part of who we are. In a world that emphasizes self-preservation at all costs, think about the impact our willingness to show up, to see people for who they truly are, and to be seen as our authentic selves could have. Not only will we start to bridge those soul-sucking human divisions, through us, people will see God such that they cannot resist a relationship with God, the embodiment of love and the giver of abundant life. May we take a chance on trust so that others will do the same with earthly and eternal effects. Amen.